on schedule, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. There's more people probably still coming. So. so I want to introduce to you Lori King. She is the founder of 50 Cents Period, um, an organization that was founded in response to public health and social disparities facing women and children around the world. For nearly 20 years, she has worked toward these endeavors in the field of reproductive health and international development across the sectors in East Africa, Russia, and South Asia, with distinguished agencies such as CARE International and United Children's Fund. Her HIV and AIDS case management training curriculum, designed for post-genocide Rwanda, was chosen as a training standard by the Rwanda Ministry of Health. Domestically, she founded Just Cause Incorporated, an agency focused on serving newly arrived refugees by providing stopgap and specialized case management services to HIV positive female survivors of rape, war of rape warfare, torture, and genocide. For six years, she has served with the International Services Division of the Metropolitan Atlanta Red Cross and as her Health and Human Rights Coordinator and Landmine Education Specialist. Lori studied, studied at Oglethorpe University, receiving her bachelor's degree in international development, and holds postgraduate certificates in human and health, health and human rights and health in prisons from Harvard University School of Public Health and Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Further studied for her master's of international public health at the University of Liverpool. She retains active membership in the American Public Health Association, American Association of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. Association of Reproductive Health Professionals, the Society of Menstrual Cycle Research, and then Chris Deva, Chris Deva. Chris Deva Philosophy Circle. <coughs> In her spare time, she continues to volunteer with Atlanta Refugee Community and acts as a community organizer for Atlanta's East Side Pride. She lives right near us in Clarkston with her husband Adam, her son Isaac, she has two dogs and three cats that she spoils. We're really happy that she's here with us today. Thank you. Can y'all hear me? Yes. Good, okay. I am really excited to be with you guys this morning. I come from a long line of nurses. My great-grandmother and my grandmother were Red Cross nurses. And my mother's a nurse, and she met my father at the Fort Dietrich Army Hospital in Bethesda, Maryland. And my very first job, of course, instead of working at Kroger or fast food somewhere, my first job was actually working as a medical assistant in an oncologist's office. And so I kind of grew up reading my mom's nursing journals like they were bedtime stories. And I'm, I, I was just so excited when I heard about your conference. Also, I want to point out, this is my first time in this new building, and it's beautiful. I had my son when this was being built, so I had to deliver at Hillendale, which was very nice. I shared with a few of you, it was kind of like a spa experience. It was just newly opened. Um, but going through my own experience, my son ended up being 10 days overdue. Um, he was a nine pound baby um, and breech. And, and so of course, you know, my midwife friend who had turned her own 10 pound baby, of course she was out of town when that happened too. And so here I am like with the breech baby and you know the birth plan goes out the window and I'm sitting there crying my eyes out because you know by that point you just want the baby out of you. You're just like I don't care, just get it out. And um, uh, you know you just throw the birth plan. It's like what birth plan? The only plan we have is the baby's coming out. That's, that's it. And so <laughs> after that whole experience and then you know coming home and realizing you know I went from running um, HIV programs in a conflict zone to being kind of ball and chain to my nursing chair. And I was like, oh my God, what just happened to my life? And, and there were all these things that no one told me. And then when I went back to work, I, I was lucky enough that I was working in a field where taking my son to work was absolutely right on par. And so one of my Somali sisters gave me this piece of fabric, taught me how to tie it, I had my son on my back and I went right back to work. And I was working right down here, down the street at the refugee health clinic, um, much to the chagrin of my pediatrician. She said, you took your son where? And I'm like, oh yeah, just the refugee health clinic and the TV clinic. Um, and so, <laughs> so she wasn't really happy with me. Um, I, I should point out he has tested negative and defects has not shown up yet. So. <laughs> We're on a roll so far. But as I began, you know, through my own birth experience, you know, everybody tells you things change when you become.
become a mom yourself, right? Like all of a sudden you have this different perspective. And one of the things I noticed too, and the work that I was doing, especially with the refugee women, and when I was still doing field work, when I went across Africa, when I was in South Asia, that I was getting a little more street cred than before. It's like, oh, all of a sudden, like you're in the mom circle. All right, you really understand this. You know, because before, if I would go and people would be like, you're how old and you're not married? What? You know, you don't have any children, what's going on? But then I began to see, oh my God, look what happened to me in my own experience. What if I threw on top of that, I had never been in a hospital before, or I didn't speak the language. Then I had all these people coming in. And I began to see this in my own caseload. I began to see it in the programs I was running with the women. It was hard enough to get a woman who had been through torture, trauma, genocide, something, to even open up and talk about that, let alone to let somebody touch her. But you know what? That's what's happening with you guys every single day. You're getting women, all of a sudden, who are upstairs in labor and delivery or coming in for an emergency, having a miscarriage, there's a, there's a language barrier, there's a cultural issue, and it's like, oh my God, what do I do? And trust me, they're just as freaked out as you are. Um, and so that's why I'm here today, is to hopefully give you a little bit of background on how refugees even came to be in DeKalb Medical Center, the certain things they're going through, just maybe so that you guys have some more resources and some places where you can reach out when you've got questions, and some special things that are happening here. And so the first thing that I want to talk about is who even is a refugee? Because you know in the States, we tend to use a lot of words interchangeably, right? Um, it's like, oh, well, they're an immigrant, you know, or they are um, Latino. But you know what? A Latino person will, will fight with you of whether or not they're Hispanic and vice versa. Mm -hmm. There are nuances, but it means a lot for us to be able to know that, right? So a refugee was, is actually a term that was defined in 1951 after World War II under the Convention of the Status of Refugees. And that's someone who basically they're owing to well-founded fear that they are persecuted based on race, religion, nationality, membership to a particular social group or political opinion that they are unwilling to avail themselves of returning there because they're fearing for their own life. So by the time a refugee gets here, you can pretty much Yes, they've already been through some kind of trauma, right? If not some torture. But an asylum seeker is different. An asylum seeker, every single refugee was at one time an asylum seeker. You have to be an asylum seeker when you get to your camp and then you fill out a form to even be granted refugee status. An immigrant is someone who voluntarily takes up residence, they have their own resources, or by somehow they got to another country but they weren't, they didn't have to fill something out and be granted a special status. A migrant is a catch-all term for someone. Like you think about, remember a few years ago, we had the whole upset in South Georgia about people not wanting to have the migrant workers there working on our produce farms. And then guess what happened? We like ended up without a lot of strawberries or lettuce and stuff like that. That is a migrant worker. Um, a migrant worker might also be an economic migrant, and an economic migrant is just that. They're moving around because of the labor that they're involved in, and they are constantly looking for economic stability. An internally displaced person, something in our own country that we experienced a few years ago. Y'all remember Hurricane Katrina, right? Mm -hmm. And people were like, people are refugees coming to Atlanta from New Orleans. No, they were not refugees. They were internally displaced people. And it would seem maybe splitting hairs to a lot of people, but the term refugee is much like the term genocide. Once that word gets used, then there are certain international laws that kick into play. That's why we have to split hairs with that. A stateless person is somebody who is considered like they don't belong anywhere. And an example of a stateless person, and that, can you imagine like not being a citizen? Like at least, like if we're a US citizen, right? And we go abroad, it's like, okay, I've got my blue passport. If I'm in trouble, I can go up to my embassy, I can get in there and I can try to get some help, right? Well, what happens if you're stateless? An example of a stateless person would be like a Palestinian person. Or roving up in parts of like Syria, Algeria, across North Africa and the Middle East, there are groups of Bedouin people, Tuareg people, 
who have wandered for millennia and they do not belong to any certain nation state. That's a stateless person. And in the refugee camps, it's very hard for stateless women to get any kind of services because they can't prove that they're from anywhere. And so oftentimes there becomes this pecking order that happens in the refugee camp. Stateless women are on the bottom. They are like bottom of the barrel. And many times they have to bribe officials to get food for themselves and their kids, or they have to trade sexual favors. So being a stateless woman is something you do not want. Now where did they come from? Um, the top countries for asylum claims last year were these. Um, Syria, Russia, Afghanistan, Iraq, Serbia, Pakistan, Iran, and Somalia. And what you're probably noticing, the ones that have stars on are countries that still are involved in active conflict. So what that means is that because there's still war going on there, we're still processing a lot of claims, and we're not going to see, we're probably not going to start seeing Syrian refugees here until at least another year, because it takes a while, as you can imagine. Anytime the government's involved, right? Long time bureaucracy. Um, when you're in a refugee camp, by virtue of the fact you're a refugee, you are a guest in someone else's country. You're literally just camped out there, right? So one of the things you're not allowed to do is you're not allowed to own property because property, <coughs> you know, it, it uh, implies what? It implies that you're staying there, right? That you own something. You're not allowed to cultivate. So if you're in an area, even if you have really great soil and you could grow a nice garden, you could have some chickens, whatever. No, you're not allowed to do that because that also implies ownership. You have restricted movement. Sometimes, depending on where you are, you're not even allowed outside of the camp. Um, or if you are out allowed outside of the camp, if you're in an urban refugee camp, you sometimes will be allowed to go outside and work, but there's a strict curfew and you have to be back inside by a certain time. Um, there's a registration and interview process. And after 9-11, our whole registration and interview process changed quite a bit. And so basically, when our government generated its big terrorist watch list, they put in something called the Material Support Clause for everyone applying for asylum status here, seeking refugee status, any kind of visa that you were applying for here. And so imagine if you were a woman in Central Africa and a guerrilla group came through and they raped you and your daughters, they killed your husband and your sons and they said, okay, so if you don't go ahead and let us stay here for the night and you don't give us all the clothes that your husband and your son had, we're going to kill you and your daughters. What are you going to do? Right? You're just going to go ahead and like give them whatever they want. Then the next morning you're going to get up and just run like hell and get to the nearest place that's safe, right? So say that that happened and you got to the refugee camp and you have to fill out your big asylum application. And then what happens is somebody from UNHCR, which is the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, and the US State Department will come in and they'll look at people's files and they'll say, well, we think these people would do well readjusting to life in the United States. We will interview them and see if they will qualify for a refugee visa to come here. And so they get you in the room and they're like, okay, well, tell us your story. And they're moving and grooving with you and they're hearing the story. And then they say to you, well, do you know who it is that came and killed your husband and your son? Yes, yes, we do. Well, what group were they with? Were they with a certain group? Oh, yes, they were with this group. Then the person from the State Department pulls out their little terrorist watch list. And if that group happens to be on that list, guess what? You're not getting in because you provided material support and aid to a terrorist group. Oh, no. And so there are thousands of women languishing in camps all over who are not allowed to get refugee visas to the United States because of the material support clause. Um, there's the constant fear, as you can imagine, because of that, for your personal safety. I'm sure you guys are all familiar. You've seen pictures. Remember when George Clooney and Matt Damon were in Darfur and uh, they were giving, lending their voice to the plight of refugee women there who were being raped when they were going out looking for firewood. That doesn't just happen in Darfur, it happens in camps all over. Um, sexual assault is rife in refugee camps, um, especially if you are a single woman. Um, there's food and water that are rationed, limited medical care, limited schooling. So basically what you're doing is your whole life has just been kicked into basic survival mode. You're in that complete fight or flight mode 24-7. 
we didn't have a formal response to refugees coming to the United States until 1980 under the Reagan administration. And that was in response to the Vietnamese boat people crisis. And that is basically where they regulated services and rights afforded to refugees that were seeking asylum in the United States. They appointed voluntary resettlement agencies and they identified in a, an initial 13 what they called gateway or welcoming cities during that time. And in 1992 when President Clinton was ruling our country, he came on and he said, well, you know what, all states, not just those 13 initial resettlement sites that we picked, everyone who was able to support a population greater than their own is going to have to start accepting refugees. And so, as I was saying, um, Atlanta was picked because of its ability to sustain a population greater than its own. At the time, we had a stable and expanding job market, low rental cost, and a wide social service infrastructure. And then DeKalb, as you guys are probably aware, just look around, sitting in the room, we are one of the most ethnically diverse counties in the United States. And so for the past 30 years, since 1980, when the Refugee Act was set up, over 70,000 refugees have been resettled here in DeKalb. And mostly in the little corridor that you would see out, you know, Clarkston, Hairston Road, out on that side of DeKalb. And approximately 75% of all refugees that are resettled in Metro Atlanta get their initial 30-day health screening right down the road at the Refugee Health Clinic on Win Way. Well, when they come here, guess what? They're an invited guest of our country, but they have to pay for it. They're given an interest-free airfare loan to get here that they have to pay back. Um, they are set up with initial housing and standard furnishings. So you know, like there's a bed, there's a chair or a couch, basic things like that. They get provisionary Medicaid and food stamps. That's when you guys are seeing a lot of them during the first six to eight months that they're here. Um, they get the first available employment. Now what that means is, by virtue of the fact you're a refugee, you're probably not stopping on the way out of town to get your college transcripts, right? That's just not gonna happen. And so if you come to the United States and you are a nurse in your country of origin, or a doctor, or an economist, your credentials don't mean anything. Nothing. So basically what that means is you are at ground zero. And because you agreed to the stipulations of you being granted that refugee visa, even if you're an economist, you're taking the first available employment. Many times that means if you have great English proficiency, yeah, good for you, you could end up working somewhere like Starbucks or the Marshall's Warehouse or the Cap Farmer's Market. But if you don't have good English proficiency, guess where you're probably going? You're going to one of the chicken processing plants in Oakwood or Riverdale. And so at any given time at any of the chicken processing plants, that we have school administrators, economists, doctors. It's absolutely <coughs> horrific. And you know, because you're a refugee, you're not usually, you know, banking enough money to, you know, pay three hundred dollars to have your transcripts if you can still get them evaluated. So many times it just like kicks off another cycle of poverty once you get them. <coughs> um, within first the first thirty days, you are supposed to get an initial health screening with referrals. Um, state offered programs, you get your initial I-94 process, which is what, you know, that's kind of like your equivalent of your green card. Your I-94 means you came in on the refugee visa and you're on a five-year track to citizenship. That's what you signed up for when you agreed to be a refugee here. And your kids get enrolled in school. Um, so here's probably the populations that you're seeing here, because for the last year, here are the top countries of origin for the refugees. Bhutan, Burma. Democratic Republic of the Congo, Eritrea, Ethiopia, Somalia, Iran, Iraq, South Sudan, and Sudan. So that means that you've got 40 plus, plus ethnicities, tribal groups, and language groups. How's that for just uh, putting a little spice in your day? Right? And then you guys get in when they're in pain <laughs> and ready to give birth. Uh, when the men are having to speak for them, or sometimes their kid. And it doesn't work so well, does it? Um, so the majority of all those countries that we just talked about, here's the crazy thing. Um, we are now um, two and three generations deep in refugee camps. So that means a lot of the women, a lot of the children you're seeing, 
were either born in a refugee camp or they've grown up in the refugee camp, they've gotten married there. It's just going on and on and on. Like some of the Burmese that you're seeing, they have been living in refugee camps on the border with Thailand or Malaysia now for over 30 years. The same with the Nepali speakers who are from Bhutan. They've been living in Nepal for 30 plus years. And when you're seeing like the Somalis, the Sudanese, the same, they've been living in camps in Kenya. Um, the majority of all of those groups that we just talked about are from very traditional cultures. They're very strong patriarchal cultures. Um, all of them, all of those conflict zones that we just talked about, all of them were known for horrible, horrible regimes that employed um, torture, trauma, genocide, sexual violence as a way to gain control of the populations. Um, all of them, childbirth and menstruation, sexuality, even talking about it, it's some of those 10 words in public we're not supposed to say. So even imagine like trying to say it within that context. <coughs> Not going to go. Um, all of those countries pr practice early marriage. Six out of ten of those countries practice female genital cutting, circumcision, mutilation, however you want to call it. Um, but they also all employ traditional methods of healing. They prefer midwifery and wise women. But guess what? They lack a concept of preventative care because most of them know someone who has died in the hospital from lack of access to just having even basic drugs. They went to the clinic, oh, the clinic didn't have it, so they died. Or because they have rolling blackouts, the generator doesn't work. In fact, most of the refugees from Nepal will probably tell you horror stories about somebody dying on the table <coughs> there. Um, one of the reasons we see a giant spike in refugee women being pregnant when they first get here and having babies is because the preferred method of family planning in the refugee camps is the depot shot. Well, as you know, you got to keep up with your depot shot for it to be effective, right? Well, by the time they get here, by the time they get through their initial resettlement, by the time they get their 30-day health screening, by the time they get referred to an OBGYN or a midwifery clinic or a GP who will prescribe, guess what? Depot's lots. Yep. So we see a huge rates of pregnancy when they get here. Um, Domestic violence rates just across the board kind of increase during pregnancy as well. Um, and PTSD and other kinds of trauma symptoms start to manifest themselves. Sadly, like after their initial resettlement benefits are, have already gone away. You know, and you guys know the statistic, I'm sure, you know, 89% of women globally will experience symptoms of postpartum depression. 23% will ever seek help for it. So imagine just, you've already been through that come here, have a baby, and then sometimes it just all falls apart. Many times when the women get here as well and they get into one of your labor and delivery rooms, it's the first time they've ever been in a hospital. Let alone one with all the bells and whistles like we've got here. And one of the things to note, their women, infant, children benefits and food stamps don't cover things like underwear and pads, tampons either. Most of the refugee women, when they get here, they isolate. The kids adapt faster than they do. And then the kids are like, they're like kind of straddling both worlds, right? And then the whole kind of family hierarchy is kind of kicked on its head because the kids are here translating for their parents at medical appointments. We know it's not supposed to happen, but we know it all, it happens all the time. Um, the kids are negotiating um, a lease. They're helping the dad negotiate how to get a car. The kids end up learning how to drive a car first. Um, the husband will go to work, um, you know, say he gets first available employment, then with the new Affordable Care Act and Medicaid rules, the kids get to stay on his insurance or on Medicaid until they're 21, but then guess what? Guess who's left with that insurance? Mom. Mom doesn't have the insurance. And then, you know, like, so when she gets pregnant, she can get Medicaid again, but then she's only got it again, you know, until after that first check postpartum. Um, Many that you might see, it might be kind of a thing you're like, why are so many refugees born on January 1st? Um, and you see their date of birth. I get like nurses and doctors were asking that all the time. They're not. Um, it's just that they don't actually know when they're born. And so the State Department gives them that birthday of January 1st. So if you see a refugee who's got a January 1st birthday, that's why. They just don't know when they're born. Um, sometimes you'll see 
um, the same man come in with like two women. Oh, this is my sister, and she's giving birth. My other sister gave birth a while back. She's not really a sister, she's his wife, but when they came in um, under their refugee visas, he had three wives, so he put one of them as the wife and two of them as sisters. This is a common thing too, so if you see like the dude like, coming back, coming back, you're like, oh, okay, he's a player. Like, you'll know, right? Um, sometimes the refugee women even need the man's permission to come to the hospital and to seek treatment, and he will be the one, you know, for example, if the mom is crashing and you need to do an emergency C-section, you're gonna have to get his permission. Um, and many of them will carry like fear and shame of even talking about what happened to them in their country. So like you will notice, like they recoil when you're touching them or they're very quiet, they're not looking you in the eye. Um, there's a reason for that, but they're not gonna talk about it. Uh, because pregnancy and childbirth trigger other issues. Um, up until 2009, we had something called an I-60 waiver, and that meant that you had to know your HIV status before you came to the country, and then you had to be able to prove, I know you're going to laugh at this one, um, that you had medical coverage waiting for you once you got here. <coughs> because, right? Um, because HIV was considered a national security risk. And then in 2009, the Obama administration did away with the I-60 waiver, which from a human rights point of view is spectacular. From a public health point of view, it can be kind of a nightmare. Because you can opt in or out of HIV testing at your initial 30-day screening, most people opt out because they're really afraid. And women who opt in, who end up getting a positive test result, Many times they are then kicked out of the family and ostracized, beaten, blamed. Because of course you know it's her fault. You know, like of course she didn't get it from the man. Um, most prior to coming to the United States have used um, only menstrual rags or cloth to manage their period. Um, there is basically like, you can pretty much count on the populations who are coming here who have been in the refugee camps two and three decades now, like they have had no formal sex education, no formal reproductive health education, they've never been tested for HIV. Imagine being in a world where you're safe physically, but you can never go home. Just let that thing get from it. That's kind of messed up, right? So on top of all that, we have a language barrier, right? What do we do? Um, if your clinic or your hospital accepts Medicaid, your service provider, by law you are required to also provide translation services. Doesn't always work out that way, we know that. I put on there the state of Georgia language line. So if you know that someone's coming in and you get them in and you know what language they speak, if they're able to tell you, you are able to call that number 24 seven and get a translator on the line. Watch for the nonverbal cues. Ask the translator to recap at the end of the visit, as if, you know, I can't stress this enough, and I'm sure you guys already know this, but like having a female translator is key. And you want somebody, too, that they don't know. That's the thing, you want a certified medical translator who is neutral. Because there's a fear with all of those populations, they will not open up, they will not tell you the truth, they will not tell you stuff if they know the translator because they don't want that person going back to the community telling other people their business. Not gonna happen. Um, if they're still in that magic six to eight month window when they get here, usually they will still be in case management with one of the resettlement agencies, and you will be able to liaise with their caseworker. Trust me, they're carrying around that caseworker's card in their wallet um, because that's their lifeline. And you will usually be able to liaise with that translator to liaise with the caseworker to schedule the translator for their visits. When you get a moment tonight, whenever you think about it, there's a great medical doctor who's also a medical anthropologist by the name of Arthur Kleinman. Arthur Kleinman, did you guys ever hear of the book, uh, The Spirit Catches You When You Fall Down? It was a great book about a mom refugee family in Merced, California, whose daughter had epilepsy. And it was all about her experience and the family's experience in the medical system. And the book was then written by their social worker with the family's permission. 
but she liaised with Dr. Kleinman, and based on this family's experience, he formulated these eight questions to ask during a patient interview to help the provider understand what the patient was thinking, feeling, experiencing, and then how then to form a culturally appropriate response. Um, you know, this is, you know, what do you, what do you call the problem? This is a huge thing. At a clinic I work in, in Uganda, last year we saw a spike in malaria. And we're like, how is this happening? You know, the entire surrounding villages, all three of them had been given bed nets. You know, all of these things were happening, um, but people were coming to the clinic and it was just like all of a sudden, it was like 250 positives in the span of a week. So we're like, what's going on? Well, come to find out, the new lab tech um, interpreted the word fever in her tribal language as malaria because it was the same word. So every time someone came in and said that they had a fever, she's like, oh, they got malaria. You know, and it was just like a subtle thing. But you know, words mean everything. What do you think has caused the problem? Why do you think it started? Uh, what are the chief problems that the sickness has caused? What do you fear most? These are all very valuable things to stop and ask. As you probably noticed from your patients, um, the Arab and African patients can be more animated, right? They will have no problem sometimes telling you things. Uh, Burmese women can just be very stoic and just kind of look at you with a blank look. And you're like, do you understand anything I'm saying? Like, I'm here, but she's just like, mm -hmm. you know, right? The Bhutanese women will just be very deferential. They'll thank you for giving them a shot. You know, pill, thank you, thank you. You know, everything is thank you. Um, religion plays a huge part. And what's interesting about many of these cultures, you know, with the Bhutanese, you would think, oh, you know, they're from South Asia, they've been living in Nepal, you know, most of them are probably Hindu. No, there's a giant Christian community in the Bhutanese community group as well. And so what was really interesting, last year we had two women in the space of a week both lose babies. And um, the woman who was Hindu just like went up and about a business and she's like, it just wasn't their time to be here. You know, on and on, it was nothing. You know, the woman who was Christian, she grieved. You know, the family had a funeral. You know, what she went through a, a, about a year grieving process of grieving that loss. Um, You've probably seen your um, Burmese patients come in with cream on their face, and you're like, what is that? And there, it's either just smeared on there, or it's drawn and all things. That's called Tanaka cream. And Tanaka cream is made out of the bark of a tree, and it's smashed up with a mortar and pestle, and it's supposed to just be there for beautification, for softening the skin as a sunscreen. Uh, you see it to a lesser extent, men wearing it, higher extent, women. Now, the thing with Tanaka cream is that um, you don't always know the utensils you're using to smash it, so the ones that are processed in Asia sometimes have lead in them. And so it's really important if your client, if your patient is here and you see the Tanaka cream and they've got it, ask to see the jar that it's coming out of and make sure that it doesn't have lead in it. Um, there's lots of purification rites with menstruation and placenta protocol that happen around childbirth. A lot of times, a lot of like the Bhutanese or the Burmese will want the placenta um, and they want to bury it because they believe that um, after someone dies, their spirit will always return to the place that they were born. Um, the Bhutanese also believe that after you give birth, you're supposed to wash your door with cow's urine to purify it. Um, there, so, you know, there's many different nuances around this. Um, how names are constructed. Here's a crazy one. You guys have probably seen this. Central and East Africa, this is a big deal. Um, the last names don't match. We finally gotten used to in the United States. I did not take my husband's last name when we got married. My last name is King, and I was working in East Africa most of the time, and they address you by your surname. So it was bad enough people were calling me King. My husband's last name is White, and I was just like, oh, no, 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 no. You know, so I kept my last name, and we finally
really gotten okay with that where, you know, in the United States where people are like, you know, you don't have to have your husband's last name. They get it all mixed up in Central and East Africa. For example, in Rwanda, you get your own last name. Doesn't matter what your parents' last names are. Your parents don't have the same last name. They make up your own name for you when you're born. The same happens in a lot of Somali cultures. The same happens in Congolese cultures. So you guys have probably experienced this when you walk in and you're like, okay, what name do you want on the birth certificate? And they're like, okay, this, this, and this. And you're like, but that's not, that's no one's name. It's because they're making up their own name for the baby. That's why. And I know it can cause like a hot mess at Vital, vital Records, but that's how they do it. Um, Okay, something you guys have probably seen here. We have a high prevalence of female genital mutilation and cutting cases. Georgia is one of the cases that actually, we had a landmark case in 2007 that actually helped further cement all of the statutes against female genital mutilation in the United States. In 1996, it was ruled that female genital cutting was a way that you could ask for asylum. Until then, it was not um, a grounds that you could offer up as a way to seek asylum in the United States. Um, in 2007, there was a case here, which was one of the first prosecuted cases in the United States, where somebody actually went to jail for it, and it was an Ethiopian man up in Gwinnett County. No doubt about it, because his toilet was clogging in his apartment complex, the maintenance man for the apartment complex was called, and he found all of this blood and tissue in the toilet, um, and you know, called the police, of course, but it was because he had just cut his daughters. Um, World War Th the World Health Organization says, you know, that basically it's like any and all procedures that have the intent of removing part or all of the female genitalia would fall under the auspices a female genital cutting or mutilation. Um, it's practiced in 27 countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, the Northeast, Africa, Middle East, and within immigrant communities, including those here in Georgia. This happens all the time in Clarkston. Um, it's usually performed without anesthesia by a traditional cutter using anything from like a sharp piece of glass or a razor blade. It happens from weeks after birth to puberty. Um, most girls are cut before the age of five, and in many cultures, it's absolutely venerated. You see on the right there, that's a picture of Maasai women in Kenya who are traditional cutters, and they are being given, they are being paid with new jewelry and goats, because their job is very venerated in their community. On the left, you see like spanning the continent, that is a Dogon um, stone edifice where the rite is performed in West Africa, in Mali. So it's absolutely venerated. It's seen as a matter of honor. It's viewed as a rite of passage. It's key to a girl's marrying prospects. Um, and it is perpetuated by women in the culture. As you see, it's the women who are the cutters. It's passed down generation to generation. Um, in many places, they will, people will tell you, in an Islamic country, this is mandated by the Prophet. It is not mandated by the Prophet. Nowhere in the Quran does it talk about cutting your girls. Nowhere. But, note that in all of the cultures where cutting is practiced, it is not seen as a violation of a woman's rights or human rights at all. It's seen as protecting them and bringing honor to them. These are some of the traditional tools that are used in cutting. And there's also um, different like blotting powders and stuff to help coagulate the blood. But mostly like we were saying, like it's blunt instruments, not sterilized. This is how a girl recovers. Her legs are tied together for two weeks. There are four general types of cutting. So you know, you see A is normal, everything's intact. Uh, everything's intact. Type B is what just called a clitoraldectomy, and that's simple, just removal of the clitoris. Type 2 is removal of the clitoris and the outer labia. Type 3 is the most excessive. Type 3 is where you've removed the clitoris, the outer and inner labia, and then you've stitched the woman together 
all the way to where she only has one hole left through which to pass urine and menstrual blood. That's called infibulation. That is what full infibulation looks like. If you get this, now you know what you're looking at. The risks associated with FGM are many. Sepsis, secondary infection, hemorrhage, and death. The main reason that FGM is done is to prepare a girl for marriage. We know what's happening during puberty. Guess what that also means? She's getting married. Ladies, look at your hips. Are your hips the same size they were when you were 11? No. For those of us who have had children or several children, it just seems like they just keep spreading. Um, when you're a baby, having a baby, those hips are not ready for that. Um, you haven't, uh, so then what are you gonna get? You're gonna get obstructive labor, which is also gonna lead to what? Fistula, right, and fetal death. Um, compaction of menstrual blood, ripping and tearing during sex and childbirth. I mean, basically, like, think about it. Like, she, a woman's never gonna have an orgasm, right? Like, that's just gone. Like, that's completely, like, taken away right there. Um, <coughs> Most likely she will get obstetric fistula unless she has access to any kind of clinic because you can pretty much guarantee obstructive labor. Um, in cultures that do practice full infibulation, most women are stitched back together after childbirth. So she's just like scarring keloid tissue just over and over again, not to mention PTSD and emotional trauma that come with that. Um, I have had women who are survivors of FGM who have told me they have walked out of doctor's offices or clinics because of the reaction of the nursing staff and the doctors when they have been on the table. You know, one of, one of my clients told me she was there, imagine, you know, coming here up in the stirrups, and the nurse walked in and was like, oh my God, what is that? And opened the door and called to her colleague, you gotta come see this. You know, and my client got in her car and left. She's like, oh, I forgot something in the car and left. Um, always know there are going to be other issues. So it's always good, you know, now you've got that, you're like, what else is going on? Because she's got to have, you know, menstruation is just painful when you've been cut. She's probably had like repeated urinary tract infections. So that should be like the light goes on there. Um, absolutely record it in her chart. That goes without saying. Um, liaise with the caseworker. Um, and the patient education, she will never ask for this, but I promise you, one of the questions she's gonna have is what can I do to make sex more, more pleasurable? It's never gonna be awesome, right? But like, what can I do to make it not hurt? Lube, tons and tons of lube. Just send that sister home with lube. I cannot just say that enough. Just talk about it. They, they will be so appreciative. Um, yeah. So what can we do here? Um, essential to include more midwifery service options. Like, again, like most of our refugee sisters are more comfortable in a setting where it's a woman who's doing all of her primary care. It's a woman who's going to attend her during birth. Um, liaising with the ethnic community associations to find out what um, cultural childbirth practices are, health promoter trainings. This is one of the things that my organization and another organization called Women Watch Africa is working on right now, is doing health promoter trainings where we're training women to be basically the health liaisons for their own communities. And we are trying to train postpartum doulas to be able to go around and do checks on the women after their home, in-home doula services. and. We would love to recruit more nurses to join our teaching teams because we do programs of reproductive health education for refugee women when they first get here. We're always needing like to expand that. So if any of you guys are interested in coming and just spending more time with refugee women and learning about the experiences that they're having and if you would like to help them learn more about their body, we welcome you to do that. Um, I put on there, and it should be on your handouts, key contacts, my information is there, Lori's information is there. All of the resettlement agencies, that is the numbers. So if somebody says, I am with, I came in with World Relief or Catholic Charities or International Rescue Committee, 
but they can't remember their case workers phone number, you can call there and find out. So thank you for letting me be here, and if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer those.
How do you value one body over the other? That's the thing. You know, and even there are, and the thing is, like, we're not going to change it. Oh, it's such, like, a nice, awesome, lofty thing. Half my family's Jewish. Guess what we talked about when we found out we were having a boy? You know, yes. and it was just, like, World War Three up in that living room, like, over names, over the circumcision <laughs> thing. Um, and I just got back this, um, I started this year in Liberia. And in Li Liberia is a country that practices cutting. And they do it every spring. And there is a doctor there and a nurse midwife who are both educated in the States. And then they went home. And the nurse practitioner said, you know what? Like, she comes from the, um, the Zo tribe, I mean, the Zo tribe are bid cutters. She's like, you know, I know I'm not going to change this practice. It has been, like, for millennia, this has been passed down here. But you know what I am going to do this year? She's like, I am going to reduce death by sepsis and secondary infection and hemorrhage because I'm going to go out and I'm going to teach sterile surgical procedure. And I'm taking the cutters out, you know, boxes of, like, sterile razor blades and single-use scalpels. I'm teaching them how to do it, and I'm teaching them how to stitch. You know, she took a lot of heat from the activists, like, in West Africa who were just like, no, this is horrible. How can you do this? You're perpetuating it. Are you? Are you really? You know, because in my mind, she just saved a bunch of lives. She just, we have to work with the system we have, and we have to meet our patients and our clients where they are, you know, not where we think they need to be. It's like the people who gave us, you know, clean syringes to. Needle exchange, exactly. It's just yeah. like needle exchange. So do they circumcise their boys? No. No. Men are not circumcised. No. It's the ironic thing, right? Like the, the inverse of culture. Any more questions? All right, well, thank you again, and thank you for the work that you do as nurses. It means a lot. So, on behalf of my mom, my grandma, and my great grandmother, thank you. <laughs>